I direct your attention again to the 15th chapter of the book of John, where we've been for many weeks since the beginning of the year, talking about the last sermon of Jesus to his closest followers. I want to share these words with you again. The series is called Abide in Me, and all of the notes uh, of what I'm about to share today are available to you. You don't have to write anything down. Text the word notes to 68,000, and you'll have the notes, plus some other resources as well. But hear the words of Jesus one more time and actually catch the picture of what he's painting. He says, I am the true vine, my father is the gardener, and you're a branch. Now you could be a branch that's disconnected on the ground, drying up, useless, but he picks you up and he grafts you in, and he says, abide in me, like stay, remain, keep connected, live in me. And if you do, then I will flow through you. I will meet all of your needs. So abide in me and I in you. He who abides in me bears much fruit. Stop right there. That's the goal of your life. That's the purpose of why God puts you on the earth is to be productive and to be not only blessed, but to be a blessing to others. And until you discover that, you'll never be really happy. That You are, you are designed by God to bless others. Now without me, if you're not connected, you won't be able to do that. You can do nothing. But if you abide in me and my words abide in you, so if you stay connected and you're connected to the purpose of God, you can ask for whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. I think I may ponder that part of the verse the rest of my life. What does that mean? That's causing me to grow more now than I've ever grown in my life. I just wanna invite you to come with me and climb higher, keep growing. Because he says that if you, if you will live this way, producing fruit, asking God to give you more so you can produce more fruit for others, by this my Father is glorified. By this God will receive glory. In other words, the people will, will experience something of God through you and they will say there must be a God. In fact, they will say this must be a true follower, a disciple of God because of the way they live. So he gives us a vision for how to live our lives. And then he kind of closes by saying, as the Father loved me, Jesus says, I love you that way. So remain, stay in this idea that I love you. So you're not what you do, and you do a lot, but you're not what you do. And you're not what other people say, and they say a lot of things, some good, some bad. And you're not what you've accumulated, what you have, what you've collected, you're more than that. But all these things that come at us, they're not telling us the truth about who we really are. And we live in a world where we start to think over time, well, if, if I have to provide for all of my needs, well, clearly I don't have enough. And if I don't have enough, then I need to have more. And life becomes driven and life becomes a pursuit, uh, longing for something to to fill the inside, uh, and really there's a, a, underneath all of our needs is the need that we have, and that's this relationship with God that we're looking for. And so because of that, so many of us get into places financially, which is where I've been kind of focusing. It's one thing to have this as a lofty thought for your wall, or a mug on it to say, abide in me. It's another thing to try to abide in the truth that I don't have to prove anything to anybody. I, I have all that I need. So I'm trying to land this into the reality of our life uh, and by giving you a, a tool to help you navigate the financial part of this, which is why we gave you the book uh, Master Your Money by Ron Blue. There's still a few available if you'd like one for free. We wanna invest that in you because you're not what you have, you're more than that. In fact, all of you are in some category that Ron Blue illustrates in the book. He says there are people who are struggling there's people who are barely making it, you're, you're stressed out, people who are surviving, meaning you're making it, but it's just barely. If one thing goes wrong, you know, you're gonna be struggling again. Then there's people who are stable and secure and people who have a lot and they're not struggling for their needs anymore, but their problems are almost greater. I think there's a myth that thinks that the, when you're struggling, that's where all the problems are. And if you had surplus, you wouldn't have any more problems. <laughs> that's just not true. In fact, the more you have, the more you have to worry about. And actually, the more people have, the more stressed out they are. And if money brought happiness, then that would mean that the richest people are the happiest people in the whole world. 
And that's not true. You all watch the reality shows of their miserable lives <laughs> for your entertainment. <laughs> so, so something is off here. And so underneath it all, our money problems really are spiritual in nature far more than we realize. There's something driving our pursuit of having more. And so Ron Blue in his book has laid out these five spiritual or biblical money management principles, which I've been going through. First one we started off was spend less than you earn, duh. But it's hard because there's something driving us. We have to learn contentment. We don't have that naturally. We have to learn how to be happy with what we have. Because if you don't learn that, having more, you'll never be happy. You'll never have enough. And then avoiding the use of debt. In other words, borrowing from the future in order to have today. What a terrible idea when we live in this culture that it says shop like a billionaire. You ain't no billionaire. Stop it. <laughs> don't. Don't spend what you don't have. Don't borrow and mortgage away your future and find yourself in financial bondage. You need to learn how to save for your future. And then you need to learn how to set long-term goals, which is where we are today. I wanna to talk to you about long-term goals. We don't think much about the future. We tend to live so much in the moment. In fact, there's a lot of lessons. Young people, you hear it all the time, live for the moment, live for today, live for the now. You'll hear that everywhere. You'll hear that over and over, and it's terrible advice. You need to live for tomorrow. You need to have some long-term goals. Look what Ron Blue says in his book. I love this. He says, the longer term your perspective, the better your present decisions are likely to be. That's not just a money principle, everybody. That's a life principle. The more you think about the impact of your future, the better your, the better your choices will be right now. And so, we have to learn how to think long-term. Mo most people don't think that way. A lot of, even a lot of religious people, church people, churches don't even think long-term anymore. They think so much about the now. There was a time when you could count on a church to be there, prepared to help you uh, uh, when, a, when the child is born and at the time of their death. But not so much anymore. Now so much we think about just today and you know, uh, one of the reasons why we built the Resurrection Memorial that provides a place for us to remember our loved ones and to have a place where, uh, you know, where people, uh, their remains can be, can be memorialized, we did that because of long-term thinking. I, I don't understand why people don't prepare for a trip they know they're going to make one day. But people don't, oh, that's hard, I don't wanna think about that. Well, that's, that's the problem. That's what we do with our money. We, we don't wanna think long term because, oh, that's just difficult and we try to live in today. And then you end up leaving your family in a crisis because you never thought ahead, you never planned. Right. I encourage you just to be people who plan for your future. Now, Ron talks about this in the book. Can I just show you on page 50, I think, 50, I think he says, to create or increase margin, which is the goal. I want peace in my life. I want, I want there to be, I don't want to be in debt. I want to have more than I need so I can start to build a future. He says, you're going to have to increase margin, but there's only two ways to do that, two choices. Either you increase your income or you decrease your expenses, which probably you have more control over the second one than the first one. But he says, this is the hard part because in order to generate enough cash flow margin each year to meet your long-term objectives, you have to make the long-term a priority over the short term. There's no way around it. You gotta start thinking long-term. And I wanna help you today. I wanna help you. This whole message is about thinking a little more long-term and the impact you can have and how time can either hurt you or time can either help you. So if you're in debt, time is hurting you. It's compounding the debt. It's comp that interest is coming against you and you have to pay more the longer you have the debt. But if you don't have the debt and you're saving, the more time you have, the more, the more uh, you're going to multiply what you have. Let me illustrate it this way. Last week I talked about this debt snowball. If you could just find 200 extra dollars and just start, uh, you say, how do I find extra $200? Oh, go back and listen to the message. There's a lot of ways for you to find 200 extra dollars Somebody got so mad that I talked about the dog and the cat, and I just apologize in advance. I'm not getting rid of my dog. I apologize. I wasn't serious. I was joking, okay? I was just joking. Some of you all take me way too seriously. Can you tell them I'm joking? I'm just joking. I'm not, I'm not, I don't hate dogs. I, I love dogs. If you don't know what I'm talking about, you need to listen to last week. I got in trouble. <laughs> Don't sell the dog for the $200 is what I'm saying. 
I didn't, I didn't, I shouldn't have said it. But you find 200 extra dollars and you apply that to what you're already paying on one debt, you pay that off, now you take that debt payment, or you take the minimum payment and you take the $200, you pay it to the next debt and so on, you get a snowball rolling. It was a great example of the power of just, you can get out of debt quicker than you think. But here's the exciting part. Once you've paid off the debt, you know what you, what could, you could do with that $200? You could save it and not just consume it on the moment. If you save that, let's just say you took 200 cash uh, and you stuck it, 200 a month, that's it, and you stuck it under your mattress in cash. Do you know by the end of your working life, do you know how much money you would have? You would have close to $100,000 under your mattress. Now some of you can't even imagine having $100,000 of cash, but that's just if you had $200 a month and you stuck that away. You found it to pay off the debt, now just save it. But that's not how you do it. Let me tell you something, if you were to take that $200 a month and you were to invest it in a savings account, or WIF, or something that's gonna pay you a, a, an interest rate of return, there is the law of compounding interest, and you have no idea. You would not have 96,000 at the end of your working life, you would have over $400,000 from that $200 a month. That's the law of compounding interest. That's, that's having a long-term goal. Have you ever invo involved God in your long-term goal process? Like, God, I wanna be here someday. Would you help me to do that? Most people never think that way. By the way, it's so easy to lose that $200. And we lose it not $200, we lose it $20 at a time. So let's say you just take that $20, you overspend the category of your savings by $20. And by the way, you can't do nothing that's not $20 now. I mean, you, the two of you go to McDonald's today, it's $20. That's it, $20 to go to McDonald's. But you, you, can, you can blow 20 bucks without even thinking about it. Now let's say you only do that five times in a month. You, you're pretty good, but it's $20, what's $20? Like, hey, I enjoyed McDonald's, it was great. What do you, what do you, I love the Happy Meal, you know? Well, every time you do that, it adds. So now let's just say you did that five times, you kind of overindulged, you, went, you, went, you, you called the food truck to come to you, $20. You didn't just lose $20 is what I'm trying to say. You lost half of what you had budgeted to save. If you lose half of what you budgeted to save, you're losing the future potential of $200,000. Did y'all miss that? You could, if you save that, $400, that $200 a month, you could have, with interest compounding, you could have $400,000 by the end of your time you're ready to retire, just sitting there. And some of you could do a lot more than that. But if you just had $200, but if you just let it slip away $20 at a time, it's actually costing you what you could have saved. So every time you cut your saving potential in half, $20 at a time, it costing you about $200,000 of your future earnings. So you have to have some long-term goals. The longer time you have in front of you, the greater the opportunity for multiplication. Now Ron will explain all of this in the book. I'm just a pastor. I'm not a, I'm not a, I'm just a caveman. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just a pastor. I don't wanna to talk to you about Matt today because he can do a better job at that. I, I wanna to talk to you as your pastor. I wanna to talk to you about, about long-term rewards spiritually. And you can't have long-term rewards. There are no shortcuts for those. Like God is trying to make you into somebody. He's trying to turn you into somebody who looks like him. Actually, he made you in his image. And God so loved the world that he, he gave, he gave. He's a giver at his heart and he's trying to make you like that. The problem is people say, well, I would give. I would. Actually, it's in you. I've never met a person that doesn't want to be generous in some way, but they say, I can't. I'm strapped. I'm tight. I can't do it. I would if I could, but I can't, so I won't. But you could. If you made $60,000 a year and you just tithed on that $60,000, you just tithed, you just gave God 10%. Do you know that over the course of that same time, a person could give somewhere in the range of a quarter of a million dollars to make a difference. God could use you. At $60,000 a year, could use you to give a quarter of a million dollars to make a difference in the lives of others. I just don't think we realize our own potential. I think it just goes away from us $20 at a time. So I wanna to talk to you about long-term goals. The Bible says good planning and hard work lead to prosperity, but hasty shortcuts, you know, like the quick gratification, 
leads to poverty. So this is actually a message today about delayed gratification. It's not, God's not against you enjoying life. In fact, he wants you to enjoy life. He actually, he wants to bless you, but we rob ourselves from our blessing because we're, it's, we're consuming it so quickly without thinking about it. I wanna challenge you today to some long-term thinking because here's what I know. If you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. <laughs> you just won't have, if you have no goals, you'll just, you'll get there and you'll never, you'll have lost the opportunity, okay? So generosity and long-term planning always go together. I wanna to show you the list of these financial categories. The last two always go together. So if you set long-term goals, you will be a generous giver because that's actually inside of you to do. It just, it, it will happen. And if you give generously, the only reason you do that is because you have long-term goals. Do y'all watch on the news this week about the lady who gave a billion dollars to a college in the Bronx? It was an inspiring story because most people do that sort of thing to get their name on the hospital. She said, no name on the hospital. It already has a great name. I'm just doing this. And she gave a billion dollars so that no student going to that college would ever have to pay tuition ever again. She said, there's a need for doctors, there's a growing physician need, and I'm gonna to contribute to that problem by making sure that there's no financial barrier. Isn't that incredible? Well, I can promise you that happened, not, that wasn't random, it's because of long-term thinking on the part of her husband and herself. So we need to see more examples of that, of differences people could make, um, but it's because of long-term planning, okay? So you might say, well, why? Can you, can you put that up there again, the list of the, of the principles. You might say, well, I get the first four. That would help me. I mean, I, I know I need to spend less. I know I should avoid debt. I know I need to build margin. I can set some long-term goals for me, for my family, and so on. But why does it have to include giving generously? Some people might ask the question, like, like I mean, what if that's just optional? What if I just left that off? What if I focused on taking care of me now, and then later when I have, then I'll give. What would I lose if, I, why does that have equal standing with all the others? And what would I lose if I didn't do number five? Well, here's what you'd lose. You'd lose you. You lose who you are supposed to be, which is why at the end of the day, you can have uh, security or you can have that surplus. You can be in those other categories and you're still inside not happy. You're still inside unfulfilled. You have so much money, but you have all these other problems and you're still searching for something because you're missing out the purpose of your life. Now, listen, God has a long-term goal for you. Did you know that? God's always had a long-term goal for his people. And I wanna just show you, let Ron talk to you about money. Let, let me talk to you about God's vision, his long-term goal for your lives. So I'll take you back to the first person that he ever called and says, come, come, follow me. I've got a mission for your life. His name was Abram, later to be called Abraham. And God said to him, go forth. In other words, I'm sending you out, out of your country, from your security, from your place, from the people you know, your father's house. I'll take you to a land that I'm gonna show you. And his wife said, where's that? And he goes, you're gonna have to trust me. <laughs> I mean, think about the staggering ability that Abraham had to follow God. God says, I'll take you to a place, I'll show you, and there I'm gonna make you a great people. Now, Abraham couldn't have children. His wife couldn't have children. So here's God saying, if you let me, I will bless you and I will multiply through you. I will turn you into a great people. Some of you just need to hear that today. Your situation looks so hopeless and dead and you think, you serve a God who resurrects dead things. Now you can believe that for Easter or you can actually believe that for your life, okay? God says, I can bless you to be a blessing. And that, there is the vision statement. Put that back up for me. That's the vision statement of God. I will bless you. Why? To bless you? No, I will bless you so that you will be a blessing. In fact, through you, all the world will be blessed. Amen. Now, when God's people forgot that, when they thought the blessing, when they thought they were chosen just because we're the chosen people, then God says, uh-oh, need to be corrected. You're off mission and there would be famines and plagues and there would be wars and invasions and so on because God's people would forget their purpose and God's trying to use some pain and some suffering to bring them back. Like, do you understand that sometimes some of the things that are going on in your life is God's love for you just trying to bring you back to what he's called you to be? 
So he pulls people, he's pulling people back to saying, I chose you and I made you special, not because you're special, but just because I'm through you, I'm going to make you a blessing to the whole world. And that's not just for those people, that's for you and me right now, which is why Jesus comes to us and he, he brings it full circle and he says, if you'll just abide in me and you let me abide in you and you let my father garden you the way he wants, let him prune you, let him, let him lead you, I will make you bear fruit. This is the same promise. You will bear fruit and by this my father will be glorified. Make, make, let's make no, let's, let's not have any doubt about what the blessing is for. The fruit is not for you. The fruit's not for the branch. The fruit's for the gardener and for others for whom God designates. So, we're, so God wants to let us be a part of the blessing. He wants us to be a conduit of the blessing. But the, but the blessing's not just for us. We're, we're blessed to the degree that we let God pass a blessing through us. In fact, some of you should just start thinking that way. God, bless me to be a blessing. The person who figures that out, God will just expand your capacity. Why wouldn't he give you more once you realize what the blessing is for, okay? So by this, that's how God is glorified when he, when he actually has a people. When, that's, why, that's why he's called us and made us all differently. He chooses us, but we're different. We're unique. We're, we're not the same. He's called some of you to be artists and some of you to be bankers and builders and some of you to be tradespeople and engineers and farmers and lawyers and physicians and soldiers and uh, you know, writers, teachers. That's right. He takes, all of, he takes all these different people and he says, I'm going to use you together as a people to be my literal hands and feet on the earth. And if you do what I've called you to do, people are gonna stand back and say, oh, that's, that looks like God. And we will say, it's not us. Freely we receive, freely we give. That's, that's, how, that's how we're supposed to live our lives. We're not supposed to be all proud that we produce fruit. We, of course we would. We, we stayed connected to, to the Father. He produced it through us. Freely we received and freely we give. But I want to tell you this, there's no fulfillment, there's no real fulfillment in life except you understand this principle. You can have all the money in the world and you can have, you could be in that surplus category and if you don't realize that your life is actually to be in God's hands as a blessing for others, you will never have the joy. You'll never have it. You'll never have the joy. In fact, I say it this way all the time. Who you're becoming is so much more important than anything that you are doing or accomplishing. It's not about your success, it's not about your failures. In fact, so many Christians are caught up in all of their failures all the time. Oh, I'm such a bad person. Do you know that God knows about all that? He saw it all. He's trying to take you somewhere. He's trying to send you out to be a blessing. That's actually the goal. The devil's goal is to try to keep you condemned and defeated all the time. Jesus has already paid for all of your sin. That's why if you go back and read that John 15, it says you're already clean because of the word I've spoken over you. So stop trying to prove that you've you got to be perfect before God can use you. He just says, just get the order right. Just let me take you somewhere. Let me bless others through you. And the more you start to do that, the less you need all the things that you think you need to do to be happy. There's so much here I don't even have the time. I've got to keep moving. Who you're becoming is more important than what you're doing. So there's no fulfillment or happiness outside of becoming who you're supposed to be. So I, I see this all the time. I, I see people in that surplus category who thought that maybe at one point they, they got their life on track, but now they have more problems. They have more issues and they start to believe that I'm the source of my life and it could be taken away from me. And so they pursue getting more and more and more, accumulating more, and they're, they're less happy. And it's so funny, I've been a pastor for so long and I, I see people who have all the money in the world, they thought it would make them happier, but I'm, I'm with them in their divorces. I'm sitting with them when their kids are going off the rails. I'm with them at their award ceremonies and people are saying amazing things about them and they're sitting there with a look on their face like, is this all that there is? Maybe I need to win another award. Maybe I just need another drink. You know, I mean, there's just no fulfillment there. And unless you're there, I mean, some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of you go, I don't care. I just want to be in the surplus category. But I'm telling you that 
you can chase money all of your life and storing it up thinking that's gonna give you what you really want and you will find yourself disappointed. One, one part of the scripture says, uh, like pierced with many sorrows. So let me show you Jesus, what he says about long-term thinking. He says, don't focus on laying up for yourselves the treasures on earth, as if the treasures are your security. We think that we have to have more so that we will be safe. So we store up the things of the earth, but the earth corrupts everything. So moth uh, eats, rust destroys, thieves break in and steal, and he says, don't do that. Lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven where, the, where, where nothing can touch. Nothing can, can eat it. Nothing can steal it. So, you know, if, 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 if your heart, he says, he finishes this way, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be. You know what he's saying? Your heart's gonna be connected to whatever you think your security is. Can I say that again? Your heart gets connected to things where you think your security is. So if you think that your security is in the clothes that you wear, that could be taken away from you. If you think the security is in the car that you have, that could rust, get in an accident, be taken away from you. If you think your security is in the cash that you have, that a thief could steal, like inflation could steal it, or a lost opportunity, a job could be taken away. If your heart's connected to those things, you will never be happy, you'll always be insecure. So where your security is. So I wanna ask you the real question of the day, what is the source of your security? You can be in any one of those categories, struggling all the way to surplus, but if you've not settled this issue, you will never be happy. Who is the source of your life? In other words, where, who's gonna be the one responsible for meeting your needs? Because if you think it's prosperity, you'll always be scared. You'll always be nervous. Once you surrender to God and say, Lord, you are my source. You've gotta wrestle with this. And this is, a, this is your long-term assignment for the rest of your life. Who is the source of your life? Jesus says, see, no one can serve two masters. You're gonna to have to decide who's the boss. Is God the owner of it all or am I the owner of it all? Am I the source of my needs or is he the source of my needs? No one can serve two masters. He'll either hate one and love the other or he'll be loyal to one and he will despise the other. You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon means you can't make a money, you can't make a, a God out of your money. Like you can love money, but you can't have God. Or put it this way, you can love God and have money, but you can't love money and have God. So I wanna ask you the question, does God really own it all? You gotta settle the issue. Is God your source or are you your source? Okay? And I wanna show you a story today of somebody who, I mean, what, what you're really after is not money, what you're really after is peace on the inside. What you're really after is the ability to just relax, like am I in control of this or is God in control of this? You're looking for where is your security gonna come from? And I wanna show you a story today of someone who is in this very position right here in this church. His name's Troy, watch this. I'm Troy Marchand, I've been coming to Heartland for about a couple of years. Before June 26, it was all about my way. You know, it was looking very bleak, both personally and in the business side. I had reached out to a bankruptcy attorney just to ask him, hey, like, this is pretty bleak. I don't see a lot of hope. You know, what are some options here um, that could potentially help me out of this really bad position? And um, the stress was it, it's to a point where it felt overwhelming. Um, I felt like I was in survival mode, fighting for my life. And it made it really challenging to just live on a daily basis and be the parent and dad I wanted to be, the partner I wanted to be. Uh, and the businessman I wanted to be. After coming to church for a couple years and, and showing up, right? I, I, I attended church on Sundays and that was about it. Uh, my prayer life was pretty non-existent, uh, but on, on this day, I happened to meet Clay uh, at Heartland. He invited me out and he didn't know why. <laughs> I just said, hey man, I'm at a low point and I need some help. And uh, so we met for a couple hours sat down, prayed, and that was the day I either gave it all up to him again or for the first time, because uh, 
You know, I had said that prayer many, many times, but uh, not sure I fully meant it and not sure I fully surrendered. And everything changed from then. 21 days of prayer came shortly after that. And then Clay and I had a follow-up meeting to talk about business because that also wasn't going well. And I knew I needed to surrender, not just, you know, my personal life, but surrender the business and everything because the stress was just too overwhelming. And uh, after that June 26th day, um, just giving it all up to him and saying, hey, I surrender. You know, this is your business, God. This is your money. I'm just a steward for this short period of time. And to come on this other side and now to be in a place where I can give and to give back. And I've been tithing every dollar that came in from that day, just tithing 10% off the top you know, before taxes, you know, this is God's money. It's just a crazy, a crazy place from 200 days to be in a place where it felt like I couldn't give anything to now giving 10% um, started that June 26th. Nothing short of a miracle, really. I mean, to see my relationships all blossom, uh, the stress just erode from my life, and then my business to literally 25x. There's still days I slip up and days I got to go back to the Bible or go back to his word and go, oh yeah, this is what he meant. Um, and just continuing to give up more and let go and let go. and Letting go is a process every single day and probably will be for the rest of my life. <laughs> I love that story. You know, Troy's not this great saint of a person, you know, he's just a normal guy. I mean, he probably couldn't come up here and quote a bunch of scriptures to you. And he certainly would say, man, I've got all kinds of problems in my life. And, you know, really just, you know, 200 days ago, like six months ago, started really following Jesus. But he says, but my situation went from bankruptcy to 25X. I know that was so fast, but let me just give you a, a, a model of what that looks like. If, if your revenue stream was $50,000 to your business, 25X is 1.25 million. I mean, that's how God turned it around in a short period of time. And I just say that God can do exceedingly abundantly above all that you can ask or imagine. Who is your source? Is it up to you? Is it all on your shoulders? What happens if you let him be God? See, that's the problem. We try to play God and we try to make, we're not very good at it. And we don't have supernatural power and we don't have supernatural resources. So God didn't bless Troy because he's special or religious or holy or whatever. He simply said, God, I can't. And will you? And then he started to do what he knew was the right thing to do. So the, Jesus said it this way, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So what I want you to do today is go think long-term. Do you have a savings goal long-term? Do you have a giving goal long-term? Do you have some kind of a future where you're thinking about, God, I wanna get there. And then some of you will say, well, I can't get there. Perfect. And just say, God, I give you my whole life. Let him take the wheel, let him take control and watch what he can do. God predictably will do what he says he will do in his word. I've seen him do it over and over. And he loves to demonstrate his power in this particular area of life more than any other. Do you guys receive this today? All right. Let's pray together. Ask God, what is he saying to you? Holy Spirit, what are you saying to my life? Lord, we're in a posture to receive. We want to do what you say. You know how to take this and apply it to each person individually. We all have different things you want us to do here but I wanna pray for the one who feels far from you today. I wanna to pray for someone who resonated with Troy's story and you said, I was so far from God, so stressed out. Maybe you've never ever prayed a prayer of surrender to God, or maybe you did, but you never meant it all the way. Maybe you did at one time, but you fell backwards, you backslid, or you did something you feel God can't forgive you for. Of course he can. That's why you're here today. That's why God brought you to, so that you could have a real relationship with him. I wanna give you that opportunity if that's you I'm talking about today, would you just slip your hand up real quick and just put it back down. Let me pray for you right where you are. Put it up, yep, I see you, yes, 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 I got you, yes. Anybody up in the risers? Yeah, I see you. Anybody else? Yes, yes sir, yes ma'am. Yes, right here, awesome, awesome. Yeah, just slip it up, put it back down. Let me pray for you, I see you, thank you, thank you. 
If you're at home, you can raise your hand and God will see you. Oh, I see you right over here. Thank you. Amazing. Can I lead you in a prayer? Pray this prayer. God, I know that I need you more than ever before. I'm so sorry for living without you. Forgive me. Jesus Christ, come into my life. Take control. Say it this way. God, I give you my whole life. I surrender. You're in first place now. I'll follow. You be the Lord. You be the boss. I'm yours. Lord, for every person praying this prayer, let the peace of God that passes all understanding just flow into their life right now. A sense of peace and relief. And may they begin to say yes to you. I pray you'd lead them over these next few months. And I pray that you'd bring order to their life. I pray that as they say yes to you in these predictable areas, I pray that you would take them to a place where they don't recognize themselves a year from now. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Come on, give God praise, everybody. That was awesome. Thank you for saying yes all over the room.